Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 270, Origins, One God. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, you'll hear a portion of an interesting short work by Origen called Dialogue with Heraclides. This episode was inspired by a couple of recent dialogues that I've been in. One is my upcoming debate book with Chris Date. In that book, he strongly insists that the New Testament teaches that the Father and the Son are the same God. And also, he insists that this has been the constant teaching of mainstream Christianity through the ages. In the book, I think I do a decent job of showing that that isn't so. When you look closely at the work of people like Justin, or Tertullian, or Origen, you can see that they don't think that the Logos, or the Word, and God the Father are the same God. The subject of today's podcast will, I think, further clarify that that was not an established view in the middle of the third Christian century. Another conversation I've been in is in the Facebook group for the Trinity's podcast. This is with a friend of mine named Micah, who lives in Tennessee. And Micah, if I remember correctly, was a Trinitarian Christian. And then at least for a short while, he was a biblical Unitarian Christian, but he has since converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. I think in his mind, he would say that now he's a Trinitarian, although I would say I think he's just a different kind of Unitarian, not what we nowadays call a biblical Unitarian, but a subordinationist Unitarian. Things that he said in the Facebook group made me think that Micah thinks that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are numerically three beings, each in some sense divine, and yet they're just supposed to be said to be one God. On the face of it, that seems like a strange sort of verbal save for monotheism. But anyway, I asked him, have you read Origen's short work called Dialogue with Heraclides? And he said he hadn't. He said, can you quote me the relevant bit? I said, well, no, it's not really convenient to quote the relevant bit because I don't think there's an electronic version of it online anywhere. I have translations in two different books. But I said, I think I'll just answer it in podcast form. So in just a little bit, I'm going to present you the relevant portion of that dialogue. But, but first, I need to introduce Origen to you and tell you about the setting and the circumstances of this very interesting ancient writing. Origen's life goes from somewhere around 186 AD until the year 255. He was probably, historians think, born to pagan parents, but by the time Origen was young, his parents, or at least his father, had converted to Christianity. He was a bit of a child prodigy, and he studied Christian philosophy and theology in his home city of Alexandria with a famous Christian teacher. And when that teacher fled because of persecution, Origen, at a pretty young age, you know, roughly today it would be a high school junior or senior, took over this Christian sort of group which was charged with teaching converts basic Christian doctrine by the local bishop. There are a lot of interesting details and stories about Origen's life that I'm skipping over, but to make a long story short, he was the greatest Christian scholar of his generation. Great on multiple fronts, he was in a sense doing Christian philosophy, he was doing what we now call systematic theology, he was doing what we now call textual criticism. And if you read a lot of Origen, It's really hard not to like the guy, even when you think that he's wildly off base on certain topics. He eventually had a falling out with his bishop in Alexandria and had to move on. He ended up in Caesarea in Palestine, where he finished out his days and his writings. He left a large library there, which was there for several generations after, and sadly, uh, most of his writing is now lost. But we still have very interesting things from Origen. Just to generalize, mainstream Christian tradition, I think, has veered drastically in the case of Origen, sort of not knowing what to do with him. He really was a great scholar, and I think in his lifetime he didn't have enough peers to argue back 
and to sharpen him and challenge him and help people to understand that, as he knew, sometimes he was just speculating and theorizing, and he didn't hold on with a tight hand to every little idea that came into his head. But the mainstream tradition, I think, has veered between one extreme, which is basically idolizing Origen and just simply latching on to him and just kind of believing what he says. And then the other extreme is just denouncing him as a horrible heretic whose works should be forbidden, maybe burned. During his lifetime, Origen was considered basically the leading defender of what was becoming mainstream small c Catholic theology. After his lifetime, and this is another long story I won't go into, he ended up being condemned multiple times by ecumenical church councils, arguably somewhat unfairly. I guess it's easy to condemn people when they're not around to speak back. In any case, In Origen's day, no one yet had come up with the idea of an ecumenical church council sponsored by the emperor, which somehow had the authority to settle doctrinal questions. They tried to settle doctrinal questions by consensus, by meeting together, hearing out the different sides, and arguing through matters. Although, in my opinion, the growing institution of the one bishop system was starting to get in the way of that consensus-based approach. Places had bishops, and things were sort of consolidating in the direction of the later one-bishop system that we see, and that we just presuppose now for Roman Catholic and Orthodox church organization. So what you're about to hear is a kind of public group meeting, but it's not really anything like a church council as later practiced. It's not hosted and presided over by a Roman emperor meddling in Christian theological affairs. And the council really isn't taking a vote on things and deciding what will count as orthodoxy, and then the losers of the vote will be kicked out as heretics. It's not quite so heavy as that. Okay, so what did happen that led up to this writing that you're about to hear? Some scholars would date this dialogue to about the year 246, so toward the end of Origen's career. There were really competing streams of theology within mainstream small-c Catholic Christianity in these years. Going back to about the time of Justin Martyr in the 150s, there was what theologians now call logos theories or logos theories being propounded in some mainstream churches. These are theories on which the logos, the word of John chapter 1, is a being with will and consciousness and power. It's a being which is with God and which is a God or which is divine in some sense. And God created the world through this Lagos. Now, you might think that's just the obvious meaning of John 1, but that wasn't obvious to people back in the late 100s and early 200s. If you think it's obvious that that's what John 1 means, that ultimately is due to these Logos theorists kind of, in a sense, winning out. Winning out at least as far as power is concerned. The real impetus for Logos theory, in my opinion, and you can see this in Justin Martyr, maybe most clearly, is a platonic view of divine transcendence where God somehow is so beyond the physical world that he couldn't have created it directly. So he had to sort of work through an intermediary that has a status in between his status and the status of created things. So Justin Martyr seems to think that God somehow emanated out of himself this second being and then created through that being. In some sense, God's Logos was in him before that, but it wasn't a person, it wasn't a being, it was just God's reason. So, I mean, a different way to put it is, God eternally enjoys Logos, reason, and then he, so to speak, extends out that reason and brings into existence another reasonable being to work through. Anyway, Logos theory was seen in the second half of the 100s and the first half of the 200s by many for what it was, which was an innovation. It was something genuinely new. In my opinion, it's not in the Bible and it's not in writings before Justin, although you can find some mention of pre-human existence for Jesus in several writings before Justin. But you don't have this full-blown Logos theory 
And it's very clearly due to, indirectly, the influence of the Greek philosopher Plato's dialogue called the Timaeus, and more directly, the work of the very Hellenized Jewish Bible commenter called Philo of Alexandria, who lived around the time of Jesus. So there was a widespread reaction in mainstream churches against Logos theories because the Logos theorists, some of them talked about one God and another God, first God and a second God. They talked about two gods. And they also seemed to have a theory of two creators. Of course, if you read the Bible, there's only one creator, and that's God Almighty, that is to say, the Father. There was a backlash against Logos theories, uh, especially by non-elites, by people who were not impressed with Philo of Alexandria and Platonic views about God and the world. Many of them had as a slogan that we uphold the monarchy, that is, the rule of the one God. We don't say that there are two gods. You preach two gods, we don't preach two gods. You guys preach two creators, we don't preach two creators. We say there's one God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, Also, there is a Son of God, yes. Now, how could they take this view if they knew about the Gospel of John? And most certainly they did know about the Gospel of John. Well, we've lost basically all the original material by these people that historians call monarchians. These are just mainstream Christians who reject Logos theories. We've lost all material from them, but just reading as hard as we can between the lines, trying to fill in a complete understanding by the context, by what their enemies say about them, they seem to have thought that the Word in John 1 is not supposed to be a being, but rather God just speaks. So the Word is like a divine attribute or an action. And yes, God creates by speaking. We know this from the Old Testament. And there isn't anything that was made other than by God's Word, God created through the Word. When it says, Theos ain halagos, God was the Word, they would probably read that as, hey guys, this isn't someone other than God. It's a divine Word. It's, it's just God. There isn't any creation by multiple gods. There's just one God who creates by speaking. And they thought that this power that God exercised in creating the world is what came to be at work in the man, Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. They didn't understand that as an eternal divine spirit flying down from heaven and entering into the womb of Mary. They understood that as meaning something like, now the same power by which God created the world, he is working through this man. And they would have noticed that in the gospel according to John, Jesus credits the Father in me as being responsible for his miracles. He clearly credits God both with his teaching and with being the source of his miraculous power in the gospel according to John. He also says the Father is the only true God, and he says the Father is his God. So, it's not really that hard to figure out how the non-Logos theorists read the Gospel according to John. Still, in elite circles, and with very philosophical apologists and scholars like Tertullian and Origen, in that crowd, the Logos theory was just really cool. And I think one reason they liked it is it let them really, in many cases, sort of change the subject away from this Jew who got killed which was kind of embarrassing to them in their social circle, in their context. And instead of talking about this Jew who got killed and who lived not very long ago and founded this new religion not very long ago, now they can talk about this divine word, which is the reason inspiring all the philosophers and sort of permeating creation. And this word is the direct agent of creation. This word is the only way we can find out anything about God. They just would much rather talk about this second God than they would talk about this embarrassing dead Jew, yes, who was raised again. Some of the early apologists can write a whole book defending Christianity and actually not mention the man Jesus. Now, for his part, Origen is trying to be more balanced than that. He does believe there was a man Jesus, and he also believes in this divine word. And he doesn't think that they're the same being or the same self. 
He thinks the man consists of a rational soul, an animal soul, and a human body. And this eternal divine logos, the divine word, is a lesser divine being that eternally is generated by God the Father in some mysterious fashion. And he thinks uh, long before the world was created, this human soul already existed. And because it was so virtuous, God united it together with the logos. And really, he thinks that in the Jesus you see in the Gospels, there's a man there, and also there's the Logos. And he will talk about them as if they're one, because they're so unified in will and purpose and action. But that's a subject for another podcast. So back to this dialogue, we don't really have a lot of information, but it seems that Heraclides was at least sympathizing with the monarchian side, the anti-Logos theory side. Some of his fellow bishops must have complained about this or raised some alarm. And basically, they called in Origen as a kind of expert witness to publicly examine Heraclides to determine whether or not he was orthodox. So what you're about to hear, on the face of it, it's a public dialogue and a public argument. I suspect it may have been prearranged so it may be that the argument really was more settled privately, and this is a kind of public performance that Origen is going to question him, and he is going to say the kind of things that Origen wants him to say. And presumably some of the other bishops who had these concerns. Now, this seems to have been held in Heraclides' own church that he presided over, wherever it was could have been in what was anciently called Arabia, possibly present-day Jordan. We don't know. So Heraclides seems to have been some kind of monarchian, or at least sympathetic to that, or maybe a little doubtful about Lagos theories. What united the monarchians was a concern for monotheism, for preserving the scriptural claim that really there's only one God. How can you go around preaching two gods if there's only one god? And you'll see that concern right on the face of the dialogue. When the Trinity's podcast returns, the interesting 20th century recovery of this manuscript. Before August 1941, this dialogue was lost to history. Earlier, patristic scholars like Nathaniel Lardner, or the many scholars involved in the production of the Antinocene Fathers series in the late 1800s, they would have killed, or at least paid a lot of money, to be able to recover a book like this. Here's the basic story as told by the late great patristic scholar Henry Chadwick in his book called Alexandrian Christianity. He writes, Early in August 1941, the British army had some caves cleared of rubbish at Tura, south of Cairo, to make a store for ammunition. This led to the discovery of a small library of works written on papyrus by Origen and Didymus the Blind. The papyri appear to have been written late in the 6th century. Both Origen and Didymus were condemned as heretical at Justinian's Council of Constantinople in 553, and it is very possible that the cash was made in consequence of the resulting prescription. Of the works of Origen, the most important is the only one so far published, the Dialogue with Heraclides. The present translation is made from the splendid edition produced by the French papyrologist Monsieur Jean Scherer. Nothing was previously known of the existence of this work. No work of origin is more obviously authentic. Online, you can find a transcription of this Greek manuscript, and it'll be relevant to some of the things I'm going to say later in this podcast. 
This seems to be a raw and uncorrected transcript of an actual public event. And later on in it, past the parts that I'm going to present, there are some bits that don't make sense. That's why they think it was not really properly put into a final draft by Origen or others. It seems to be missing a bit at the beginning. It starts a little bit too abruptly. And there are two additional parts beyond what I'm going to present, because it turns out that this matter of monarchianism wasn't the only thing that they were concerned about at this meeting. They were also concerned about public prayer, whether it should be offered to God only or to God and the Son as to two different ones, how that's supposed to work. And also, objections have been raised about the Old Testament idea that the soul is the blood, or that the soul is in the blood. It wasn't clear how you could fit this together with Origen's dualism. They end up talking about the body of Jesus, the immortality of the soul, and other topics like that. And I won't get into those, though they're interesting in their own right. Here, then, is the first portion of Origen's Dialogue with Heraclides from the 1954 translation by Henry Chadwick, with just very light stylistic revisions by yours truly. Dialogue of Origen with Heraclides and the bishops with him concerning the Father and the Son and the Soul. After the bishops present had raised questions concerning the faith of the bishop Heraclides, that he might confess before all the faith which he held, and, after each one had said what he thought and asked questions, Heraclides said, I also believe what the sacred scriptures say. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made. Accordingly, we hold the same faith that is taught in these words that we believe Christ took flesh and that he was born and that he went up to heaven in the flesh in which he rose again, that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father and that from there he shall come and judge the living and the dead, being God and man. Origen said, Since once an inquiry has begun, it is proper to say something upon the subject of the inquiry. I will speak. The whole church is present and listening, it is not right that there should be any difference in knowledge between one church and another, for you are not the false church. I charge you, Father Heraclides, God is the Almighty, the Uncreated, the Supreme God who made all things. Do you hold this doctrine? I do. That is what I also believe. Christ Jesus who was in the form of God, being other than the God in whose form he existed, was he God before he came into the body or not? He was God before. Was he God before he came into the body or not? Yes, he was. Was he God distinct from this God in whose form he existed? Obviously, he was distinct from another being, and since he was in the form of him who created all things, he was distinct from him. Is it true, then, that there was a God, the Son of God, the only begotten of God, the firstborn of all creation, and that we need have no fear of saying that, in one sense, there are two gods, while in another sense, there is one God? What you say is evident, but we affirm that God is the Almighty God, God without beginning, without end, containing all things, and not contained by anything, and that his word is the Son of the living God, God and man, through whom all things were made, God according to the Spirit, and man inasmuch as he was born of Mary. It seems you've not answered my question. Explain what you mean, for perhaps I failed to follow you. Is the Father God? Assuredly. Is the Son distinct from the Father? Of course, how could he be Son if he is also Father? While being distinct from the Father, is the Son himself also God? He himself is also God. And do two gods become a unity? Y yes. Do we confess two gods? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, but the power is wrong. Okay, what just happened there? Let's go through it blow by blow. As I mentioned, the reader has the impression that something's missing at the beginning, but it may be just that Heraclides was ordered to get up and profess what he believed. What he does is he reads the first few verses of the gospel according to John, and then he says, yeah, that's what I think too. And he seems to imply there that he thinks that the word is a preexistent being that, quote, took flesh. In other words, turned into a human being or became also human. Now, you might think that should satisfy Origen, and maybe so, but he's not going to let it rest there. So he presses Heraclides. Origen says, basically, look, there's the one God, that's the Father Almighty, the Creator. You agree with that, right? Yes, he says, right. He does agree with that. And the next thing Origen says, the point of it is that Jesus is not that same God. He points out that Jesus was in the form of God. He's referring to Philippians 2, six. there. You don't talk about a being being in the form of himself. You don't usually say that a being is similar to itself. Usually, if you say a being similar to another, you're presupposing that they really are two different beings, two entities. And he also wants to know, was Christ, quote, God before he came into the body? He wants to make sure that Heraclides agrees that this Logos has always been a separate being from God, a numerically distinct being from God, and there just didn't get to be some kind of extension during the life of Christ. Heraclides immediately collapses whether he was fully a uh, convinced monarchian or not, I don't know. But here he is going to save his rear end. He is just going to go along with Origen, whether he's convinced by reason or by a type of soft force or by both. Who knows? Heraclides says, yes, he was God before. Yes, before he came in the body. Obviously, they're distinct if you describe Christ as in the form of God. So Origen makes it a little more explicit, right? So then we do talk about two gods, although we also use the phrase one god, and Heraclides goes along with that. This is partly what makes me think it was prearranged to be performed in this way. He proceeds to confess two different gods. There's God the Almighty, God without beginning, etc., and then there's the son of the living God, who is, as he says, Theos Kai Anthropos, God and man, or a God and a man. And God made all things through him, he says, and he was born of Mary. Origen's not satisfied with that answer completely. Perhaps Origen thinks he's hiding his monarchian convictions here with just verbal agreement with Logos theories. So he presses him, is the Son distinct from the Father? Yes, he is, and the Son is distinct and also God, and so there are two gods. Yep, we do confess two gods, and Heraclides says, yes, but the power is one? And it seems like the crowd didn't like that. I mean, look, how does that help that the power is one? If someone says, in the scriptures, there's only one God, and the one true God is the Father, and you say, well, actually, there are two gods, but, you know, there's one power there. Like, God the Father shares his power or gives his power to the Son, so the divine power exercised by the Son is, in some sense, due to the Father, or it comes from the Father. Yeah, sure, okay, but um, you still got two gods, right? Just saying that the power is one doesn't make those two gods become the same god. What on earth is Origen thinking? What happens now in the manuscript is that Origen goes into full-blown lecture mode. He's going to tell the angry crowd how it is and how they should think about these things and why they should use the phrase one god when referring to God and the Son of God. Yes, but the power is one. Since our, since our brethren take offense at the statement that there are two gods, we must formulate the doctrine carefully and show in what sense they are two and in what sense the two are one God. 
Also, the Holy Scriptures have taught that several things which are two are one, and not only things which are two, for they have also taught that in some instances more than two, or even a very much larger number of things, are one. Our present task is not to bring up a difficult subject only to pass it by and deal too quickly with the matter, but for the sake of the simple folk, we will chew up, so to speak, the meat, and little by little to instill the doctrine in the ears of our hearers. Accordingly, there are many things which are two that are said in the scriptures to be one. What passages of scripture? Adam is one person, his wife another. Adam is distinct from his wife, and his wife is distinct from her husband. Yet it is said in the story of the creation of the world that they two are one, for the two shall be one flesh. Therefore, sometimes two beings can become one flesh. Notice, however, that in the case of Adam and Eve, it is not said that the two shall become one spirit, nor that the two shall become one soul, but that they shall become one flesh. Again, the righteous man is distinct from Christ, but he is said by the apostle to be one with Christ. For he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Is it not true that the one is of a subordinate nature, or of a low and inferior nature, while Christ's nature is divine and glorious and blessed? Are they therefore no longer two? Yes, for the man and the woman are no longer two but one flesh and the righteous man and Christ are one spirit. So in relation to the Father and God of the universe, our Savior and Lord is not one flesh nor one spirit, but rather something higher than flesh and spirit, namely one God. The appropriate word when human beings are joined to one another is flesh. The appropriate word when a righteous man is joined to Christ is spirit. But the word when Christ is united to the Father is not flesh nor spirit, but more honorable than these. It's the word God. That is why we understand in this sense, I and the Father are one. When we pray, because of the one party, let us preserve the duality. Because of the other party, let us hold to the unity. In this way, we avoid falling into the opinion of those who have been separated from the church and turn to the illusory notion of monarchy, who abolish the Son as distinct from the Father and virtually abolish the Father also. Nor do we fall into the other blasphemous doctrine which denies the deity of Christ. What then do the divine scriptures mean when they say, Beside me there is no other God, and there shall be none after me? and I am, and there is no God but me. In these utterances, we are not to think that the unity applies to the God of the universe, in separation from Christ, and certainly not to Christ in separation from God. Let us rather say that the sense is the same as that of Jesus' saying, I and my Father are one. When the Trinity's podcast returns, my analysis of this last portion of the dialogue. At the end there, Origen is basically mentioning the two kinds of monarchians, two different ways one might reject Logos theories. On the one side, some will collapse the father and son into the same God and say that there's a son father, and it was God himself who was crucified and things like that. Those are what historians since the 1800s have been calling modalistic monarchians. On the other hand, there are those who, quote, deny the deity of Christ, and those are the ones that historians since the 1800s have been calling dynamic monarchians. 
this is what I described before. These people think that it's the one God who is at work in the man Jesus. It's the one God who's empowered the man Jesus. I mean, this is basically the same thing as what some authors have recently called a spirit Christology, such as discussed in Trinity's podcast number 187 and 188 with Dr. Paul W. Newman from Canada. There is something divine in Christ, yes, but it's not Christ's divine nature. It's God, through his Spirit, working through Christ. As he says in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, etc. So what is Origen's answer, ultimately? His claim is that you should call God and the Son of God, quote, one God. Now, why on earth would you go and do a darn fool thing like that? They don't seem to be one God. It's not clear that the Son is a God at all. That just seems like a policy of obfuscation. You just explained how they're not the same God. Now you're telling us we have to call them one God. It seems a ridiculous, merely verbal solution to this proper concern that Logos theology violates monotheism. Origen tries to make it less ridiculous by introducing what he thinks are similar scriptural examples, where a man and his wife are called one flesh, sure, and a believer in Christ are referred to as one spirit, sure. We all understand what's going on. It's a kind of functional unity. The husband and a wife in a good marriage function as if they're one organic unit. Their lives are entwined. It's as if there's a single human being there. Of course, there isn't a single human being there, but it's as if they just function in a unified manner. The believer and Christ are not literally one spirit, but they're one in spirit. They have the same aims, the same mindset. There's one of those between them. So you say that they're, quote, one spirit. And similarly, he points out that in John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Yeah, but that they're one God? What does he think John 10.30 means? Does he think that John 10.30 is saying that Jesus and the Father are the same God, or that they have the same divine nature, or that they're one essence, or something obviously anachronistic like this? Actually, I think Origen usually gets John 10.30 just about right. In his book On First Principles, Book 1, Chapter 2, Section 8, He's talking about how you see divine type works coming out of the man Jesus. Yes, you do see that. I think he presupposes, like many in his day, that there's support there for two natures theory. But anyway, he's, he's mentioning the divine works that you see in the life of Christ. And he says, Witness the words which he said to his disciples, He that has seen me has seen the Father also, which is in John 14, 9. And I and the Father are one, John 10, 30, along with which we must also interpret that similar saying of his, the Father in me and I in the Father, which is in John 10, 38. I think he's right to put all those sayings together. I think the same idea is pretty much in all of them. The idea is that Jesus and God are cooperating, they're working together, and their intentions and their aims are the same. In his commentary on the Gospel according to John, Book 13, Section 228, he says that in the case of the Father and Son, quote, there are no longer two wills but one. It was because of this one will that the Son said, I and the Father are one. And because of this will, he who has seen him has seen the Son, and he has also seen the one who sent him. Right. He's referring there to John 12, 45. It's a oneness of will. It's a oneness of purpose. It's a oneness of aim. In his book Against Celsus, in Latin Contra Celsum, he's answering a pagan objection that, hey, you guys worship two gods, don't you? Basically, I'm paraphrasing Celsus's objection. This is in Contra Celsum, Book 8, Section 12. Origen says, in part, Accordingly, we worship but one God, the Father and the Son. Well, wait, is he saying that they're literally the same God? Actually, he's not. A little bit farther on, he says, We worship the Father of the truth and the Son who is the truth. 
They are two distinct existences, but one in mental unity, in agreement, and in identity of will. That's how they're one. That's how he reads John 10.30 and the other similar passages. And he's right about that. But he's not right that a natural way to express this is to say that they're, quote, one God. In fact, that's completely confusing because they're not one God, because they're different from each other. If they were the same God, they wouldn't be different in any way. Moreover, he doesn't think they're the same God, and it's just confusing on every level to refer to them as one God. But that's what he does. He has a considered policy of obfuscation on this and related questions. And though he gets those passages from the gospel according to John correct, in my view, he terribly misinterprets the Old Testament text that he quotes at the end. Beside me there is no other God. Who is that speaking? Who does the me refer to? Well, obviously it refers to Yahweh, the one God. That's just obvious from the context of the Old Testament. And when you look at the New Testament, this Yahweh has turned out to be the one now called the Father, our Father in heaven, the Lord God, etc. That's who it's talking about. It's the Father. When he says, I am, or I am he, and there is no God but me, right, that's the Father talking. What Origen says at the end is... You're supposed to think that the pronouns refer to God and the Word? And that's just because the God and the Word, even back then, are super unified in will and action, just like in Jesus' lifetime when he says, I and my Father are one? No, I mean, that's just, it's just an obvious misinterpretation of Old Testament texts. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a better answer Origen could make about the monotheism objection and how Trinitarians, even good scholars, misread this dialogue. Here's the puzzling thing about Origen's weird sort of merely verbal defense of monotheism. In other words, he argues for using the term one God, even though the Father and the Son are not the same God, they're two gods. Look, you have to ask what he means by God here. And he's using the word God in Greek theos in a looser sense that is distinctive of monotheism. He's using the term theos to mean just a divine being. In that sense, there are many theoi. There are many beings that are in some way divine. But in another sense, if by God you mean the one true God, the unique God, in that sense there's only one. And he thinks that's the Father. So his real answer about monotheism ought to be, there's only one God, yes, because there's only one Father, and we don't say that there are two with that unique status of being an ultimate reality, a God in the highest sense. Yes, there are also somewhat lesser divine beings, including the Son and the Spirit would be the second and third greatest beings, and then also saved people and other entities, like the stars can be referred to as Theoi in his view. So he doesn't need to obfuscate and make it sound like the Father and the Son are the same God. They're not. They're two different gods, that is to say, two different divine things, two different divine entities. But the Father is the one true God, he thinks, and this is clear throughout all of his works. One place it's clear is his commentary on the Gospel according to John, Book 2, Sections 12 and following. Here he expounds on the difference in Greek between theos and hotheos. Theos just means God, with the lowercase g, and in many contexts, when we see theos alone, we would translate it with an indefinite article in English, we would translate it as a god. Hotheos 
is just theos, the same word with the definite article the in Greek for this gender, it's ha, just the letter O with an accent on it. So when you see God with a capital G in the New Testament, typically that's ha theos. It's just the God. It's a way of taking a more generic term, just a common noun, theos, God, and turning it into a quasi name, like a singular referring term. It makes it into a title that should only apply to one. So when you see capital G, God, in the New Testament, generally that's hatheos, the God. And when you see lowercase g, God, just used as a common noun, that's going to be theos without the definite article. It's not quite that simple because in some constructions, in some contexts, when it's God we're talking about, you don't have to put the definite article onto it. So there are passages where you see it without the article, and it's still properly translated as capital G, God. For his part, Origen thinks this is a very important distinction, and uh, by this distinction, you separate God from merely divine beings who derive their divinity from him. In his commentary on John, book 2, section 17, right after mentioning the two kinds of monarchians that I discussed before, he says this, Their problem can be resolved in this way. We must say to them that at one time, God, with the article, is very God. Wherefore also the Savior says in his prayer to the Father, that they may know you, the only true God, John 17, 3. On the other hand, everything besides the very God, the true God, which is made God, that is, made divine, by participation in his divinity, would more properly not be said to be the God, but rather God, right, without the definite article. To be sure, his firstborn of every creature, Colossians 1.15, inasmuch as he was the first to be with God and has drawn divinity into himself, is more honored than the other gods beside him, of whom God is God, as it is said, the God of gods the Lord has spoken, and he has called the earth, Psalm 49.1. It was by his ministry, it's talking now about the second God, the Logos, It was by his ministry that they became gods, for he drew from God that they might be deified, sharing ungrudgingly also with them according to his goodness. The God, therefore, is the true God. It's talking about the Father there. The others are gods formed according to him as images of the prototype. And then he basically says, you know, the first and closest copy of God is the Word. He's the most divine. So he thinks divinity comes in degrees. He thinks God can share lesser degrees of his divinity with others. He does this through the Son and the Spirit. And so all these others can be referred to as gods. So a less misleading answer would be not to say the Father and Son are one God, but to say that many things are referred to as gods, uh, and yet you have to separate the source of all divinity, which is divine in a unique sense in which nothing else could be divine, from these other things which derive from him and get their existence and lesser degree of divinity from him. And these things, by the way, would include saved believers when their salvation is complete. That's his better answer. It's totally needless for him to obfuscate about calling the Father and Son one God. And John doesn't support it, and really nothing in the Bible properly understood supports it. Trinitarians are wont to misunderstand this. There's a very good book called A to Z of Origin, edited by Dr. John A. McGuckin. And on page 35 of this book, he's discussing the dialogue with Heraclides. And I think he mistranslates a bit of it. Origen says to Heraclides, But is this son, who is other than the father, not also God himself? And then Heraclides answers, Yes, he is also God himself. This is right before he says, But the power is one. I think this is a mistranslation. As far as I can tell, it's grammatically possible, but it just doesn't make sense of the entire passage. Origen doesn't say that the Son is also God himself, but rather that the Son himself is also God. That is to say that he is a God. So if you look at the Greek of this dialogue, 
And you look at the translations, the two recent ones, one by Henry Chadwick, another 1992 translation by the Roman Catholic scholar Robert J. Daly. I think the translations are, in general, excellent. However, when they come to forms of the word theos without the definite article, the, they just put capital G God in there, which is confusing. And it makes it sound like a later Trinitarian view on which they are both one God. The reason I think McGuckin mistranslated that portion of the dialogue that he put in his discussion in that book is he just wants to see Origen as anticipating later orthodoxy. He says just a paragraph later, It is substantially the classic architecture of Trinity that will emerge in later centuries to state that in the Christian understanding of God there is a plurality of divine persons and a singularity of divine essence, power, and will. End quote. Nope, that's an anachronistic misunderstanding of origin. He doesn't say there are multiple persons in the one God. He says the one true God is the Father. And also, God allows other beings to be divine to a certain extent. Now, you can take the translation by Chadwick that I presented a while ago, and following the Greek, you can just change capital G-O-D to lowercase g-o-d and say a God instead of God. If you do that, I think you get a better idea of what's actually going on in the dialogue. Another difficulty about translating this is that in ancient times, there was no such technology as quotation marks. And clearly, quotation marks are needed in the translation, but not all the way through. Toward the beginning, Origen really is saying that the two of them are two gods. That is to say, two divine beings. So you don't put the word God in quote marks there. Towards the end of the passage, though, clearly his point is about words. It should be translated that the Father and the Son are, quote, one God, end quote. He doesn't think they're literally the same God, but he thinks they should be said to be one God. Confusing? Yes. Scriptural? No. Nothing in Scripture authorizes calling God and the Son of God one God. And no, not the cases that Origen cites. Not his statement that he and the Father are one, meaning one in purpose. Not that Adam and Eve are called one flesh. Not that Christ and the believer are called one spirit. So to finish this episode, here again is that dialogue as translated by Chadwick with just a few verbal improvements by yours truly. But this time, where Chadwick translates capital G-O-D, I've corrected the translation to a god, lowercase g. I think if you do this throughout, it actually clarifies the exchange a little bit. So I'll end the episode with this, and on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org, I've actually given you the script. It's Chadwick's translation with a few little fixes, and I've put in some quotation marks, and I've made it say a god when it seems to be that was meant. And to reflect Origen's true Christology, not just that there is one Christ who is, quote, God and man, rather he thinks there is one Christ who is a man and a god. So I've put in a couple of A's there as well. So here again is the exchange with those corrections. Dialogue of origin with Heraclides and the bishops with him concerning the father and the son and the soul. After the bishops present had raised questions concerning the faith of the bishop Heraclides, that he might confess before all the faith which he held. And after each one had said what he thought and asked questions, Heraclides said... I also believe what the sacred scriptures say. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made. Accordingly, we hold the same faith that is taught in these words, that we believe Christ took flesh and that He was born, and that He went up to heaven in the flesh in which He rose again, that He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that from there he shall come and judge the living and the dead, being a god and a man. Origen said, Since once an inquiry has begun, it is proper to say something upon the subject of the inquiry. I will speak. The whole church is present and listening. It is not right that there should be any difference in knowledge between one church and another. 
for you are not the false church. I charge you, Father Heraclides, God is the Almighty, the Uncreated, the Supreme God who made all things. Do you hold this doctrine? I do. That is what I also believe. Christ Jesus, who is in the form of God, being other than the God in whose form he existed, was he a God before he came into the body or not? He was a God before. Was he a God before he came into the body or not? Yes, he was. Was he a God distinct from this God in whose form he existed? Obviously, he was distinct from another being, and since he was in the form of him who created all things, he was distinct from him. Is it true, then, that there was a God, the Son of God, the only begotten of God, the firstborn of all creation, and that we need have no fear of saying that, in one sense, there are two gods, while in another sense, there is one God? What you say is evident, but we affirm that God is the Almighty God, God without beginning, without end, containing all things, and not contained by anything. In that his word is the Son of the living God, a God and a man, through whom all things were made, a God according to the Spirit, and a man inasmuch as he was born of Mary. It seems you've not answered my question. Explain what you mean, for perhaps I failed to follow you. Is the Father a God? Assuredly. Is the Son distinct from the Father? Of course, how could he be Son if he is also Father? While being distinct from the Father, is the Son himself also a God? He himself is also a God. And do two gods become a unity? Y yes. Do we confess two gods? Yes, but the power is one. Since our... Since our brethren take offense at the statement that there are two gods, we must formulate the doctrine carefully, and show in what sense they are two, and in what sense the two are one God. Also, the Holy Scriptures have taught that several things which are two are one, and not only things which are two, for they have also taught that in some instances more than two, or even a very much larger number of things, are one. Our present task is not to bring up a difficult subject only to pass it by and deal too quickly with the matter, but for the sake of the simple folk, we will chew up, so to speak, the meat, and little by little to instill the doctrine in the ears of our hearers. Accordingly, there are many things which are two that are said in the scriptures to be one. What passages of scripture? Adam is one person, his wife another. Adam is distinct from his wife, and his wife is distinct from her husband. Yet it is said in the story of the creation of the world that they two are one, for the two shall be one flesh. Therefore, sometimes two beings can become one flesh. Notice, however, that in the case of Adam and Eve, it is not said that the two shall become one spirit, nor that the two shall become one soul, but that they shall become one flesh. Again, the righteous man is distinct from Christ, but he is said by the apostle to be one with Christ. For he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Is it not true that the one is of a subordinate nature, or of a low and inferior nature, while Christ's nature is divine and glorious and blessed? Are they therefore no longer two? Yes, for the man and the woman are no longer two but one flesh and the righteous man and Christ are one spirit. So in relation to the Father and God of the universe, our Savior and Lord is not one flesh nor one spirit, but rather something higher than flesh and spirit, namely one God. The appropriate word when human beings are joined to one another is flesh. The appropriate word when a righteous man is joined to Christ is spirit. But the word when Christ is united to the Father is not flesh nor spirit, but more honorable than these. It's the word God. <laughs>
That is why we understand in this sense, I and the Father are one. When we pray, because of the one party, let us preserve the duality. Because of the other party, let us hold to the unity. In this way, we avoid falling into the opinion of those who have been separated from the church and turn to the illusory notion of monarchy, who abolish the son as distinct from the father and virtually abolish the father also. Nor do we fall into the other blasphemous doctrine which denies the deity of Christ. What then do the divine scriptures mean when they say, beside me there is no other God and there shall be none after me and I am, and there is no God but me. In these utterances, we are not to think that the unity applies to the God of the universe, in separation from Christ, and certainly not to Christ in separation from God. Let us rather say that the sense is the same as that of Jesus' saying, I and my Father are one. Thanks to Leslie Jones, our narrator, her brother Sean Jones, the voice of Origin, and to my son Joshua Tuggy, who is the voice here of Heraclides. This week's thinking music has been the track Triptych of Snippets by Septahelix. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinities podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.